we're really pleased and happy and excited to hear from a, a well-kent face in Orcadian archaeology circles and far, far beyond that, for that matter, uh, from Caroline Wickham-Jones, who's going to uh, regale us with her personal view of the extraordinary archaeology of Orkney. So what more timely and relevant and interesting topic could there be for our AGM this evening? So Caroline, over to you. Uh, and let us know if we can do anything to help you. But I think you're, I think you're well in control there. Hopefully. Okay. Thanks, everybody. First of all, I'm going to try and share my screen, and then I will. Uh -huh. Right. I'm hoping that you can now see the um, main page of my presentation and one or two thumbs up. Yes, thanks very much. So um, in some ways, this is a difficult talk to give because of course, everybody who is logged in um, de facto knows an awful lot about Orkney archeology. span um, I just so yes, I just thought uh, I would try and put a bit of a personal twist onto it. Um, what I can't do, Haley, while I'm doing this is I can't see the chat. So maybe if there's questions, you could store them up for afterwards or something. Um, but anyway, I first came to Orkney in the early 70s and I was lucky enough to uh, work as one of the humble student volunteers uh, in the excavations uh, here at Scarabray in the um, late 70s in 1977. We had lots of adventures. Um, there was a royal visit. For some reason, best known to the organizers of the dig, uh, we got put up in the Merkister Hotel. I think my, my excavation accommodation has only gone downhill since then. Um, except that it's where I was uh, called a trollop by, I have to say, a drunken Qantas airline pilot. Anyway, um, I will now, uh, and I hadn't done anything to antagonize him, I hasten to add. Um, but anyway, that's archaeological life for you. And we will go through some of the um, highlights of Orkney as I see them. Well, of course, one of the first things about Orkney, I mean, we all know where it is. And for all of us who live here or work here or are interested in Orkney, it's one of um, several centers of the world. Equally, I think it's very important when we're thinking about the archeology span of Orkney, not to let ourselves be kind of hidebound by conventional mapping <coughs> techniques that put north at the top and south at the bottom so that Orkney is often somewhat peripheral. It's, I think, a, a good idea to, to think about other ways of looking at things. And in fact, on the wall in front of me, I've got a, a big map of the North Sea, but taken from Norway and um, slightly mimicking the image on the bottom here just to show us how Orkney can actually be at the heart of the world if you don't rely on cars and tarmac adam and large centres of population. If you rely on other things, um, on let us say uh, maritime transport, Orkney then instantly occupies a node of access. And these are there are different ways of looking at the world and it's a good idea to remind ourselves of that. Well, of course, um, yeah, Orkney is special. Uh, one of the nice things about getting lectures about Orkney is you've always got an excuse to sneak in some um, spectacular photographs and things, uh, and always an excuse to go out and take photographs. Um, <sighs> but why, why is it special? And, you know, um, what, how would we convince other people that it's special? It's something that I end up doing quite a lot actually nowadays, is giving lectures to people, whether they are uh, students from North America, whether they're prospective tourists, uh, whether they're people stuck in a cruise ship that's got um, becalmed in some part of the North Atlantic, 
uh, talking about Orkney and trying to explain why the archaeology there is worth visiting, why it's worth studying. And of course, the very first thing is that we've got an awful lot of archaeology here. If you look at this map on the screen, that is not all the archaeology in the bay. That is only a certain type of site. So, you know, I think that should make us all sort of <clears throat> open our eyes, sit up and think, if that's only one type of archaeology, what else is there? There's an awful lot of archaeology around in Orkney. Certainly plenty to keep us all busy. Certainly lots of information about the human lives of the past. Because, of course, that's what Orkney is all about. It's about um, lives. It's about looking at people's lives. I mean, I always think, you know, it's like... Um, I became an archaeologist because I'm curious about people and archaeology is a kind of acceptable way to to be curious about people. It's not very acceptable to sit on top of a double decker bus and peer into people's front rooms and bedrooms and things. But doing archaeology is a, a good way of, of doing that. And of course, it has the, the fascinating element of time travel as well. So there's a lot of archaeology here. We've got fantastic preservation. Even new sites coming up like this Neolithic tomb at Banks, they can surprise us uh, when we get down and, and into them. There are lots of organic preservation, human remains, remains of diet, remains of all sorts of things. And so there's a lot of data here to help us make sense of the past. And we're not just talking about the sites, but also about the artifacts. And I think that's one thing that makes Orkney a very special place that very often, if you go to another country, it's easy enough to go and visit lots of really nice, really interesting archeological sites. Sometimes it's quite difficult to find out about the artifacts, about the everyday paraphernalia um, that came up from those sites. You can maybe go to a museum and find out about it. But um, quite often there's a kind of separation between the monument on one hand and the finds on the other. But here in Orkney, um, we've got them very, very much together. Yes, we've got museums, but they're in amongst the remains. There's lots of information about the things that are being found. And so um, it's we're not just talking about the actual kind of monuments that people are um, trying to visit, but we're talking about the sort of everyday goods that they left behind. It's a really intimate glimpse of life at lots of different periods, whether it's knitted garments like the Orkney hood or colour or bits of string, the sort of thing that you just don't find elsewhere. Oops, now, why is that not moving on? Well, go back. And um, the other thing is, of course, that in the UK, we've the, the archaeology has a long and respectable history. We kind of have got a framework on which to hang our, our archaeology. And Orkney is a part of that. But what is really interesting about Orkney is that the archaeology here can still surprise us. It can still throw up totally unknown types of site. Um, obviously, the kind of example par excellence is the Ness of Brogga, but there's other things that happen here that um, are unusual, that get the archaeologists thinking, whether it's uh, new types of artifact, whether it's the context of particular artifacts, um, the sort of places that we're finding them, whether it's geophysical remains. There's all sorts of things going on here that can still surprise us. And if you think about it, given that archeologists have been working for well over a hundred years, that's not bad. And we have, talking about that venerable history, people, Orkney, the sort of interest in Orkney archeology span isn't particularly new. Um, we have the involvement of big names, people like Gordon Child, who was here in the early decades of the 20th century, Colin Renfrew here in the 70s. And what particularly Gordon Child did 
was he was interested in writing these kind of global texts about how society has developed. He saw his archaeology as very, very political. And he wanted to look at the rise of hierarchies, developing societies, the way communities changed. And for him, sites like Scarabray were fantastic to illustrate that sort of thing. So he wrote up Scarabray in his textbooks. And that meant that for many people, for people all around the world, Scarabray became not just an interesting place, but it was the kind of archetypal early farming settlement. And that meant that people all around the world became familiar with the archaeology of Orkney. I was once told by um, someone from Sweden that Swedish archaeologists had two ambitions. One was to go to Easter Island and the other was to go to Orkney. And it kind of brought me up short, you know, to hear Orkney being mentioned in the same sentence as equivalent to Easter Island, but it, it's a kind of reminder that we have special stuff. And um, it's, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's also a reminder that, yeah, yeah we're up there. Um, it's an interesting place. And this work, this research that's, you know, we've had lots through the, through the 20th century, but it goes on into the, the present day. There's still lots of really, really interesting work going on. I've got a real soft spot for because I uh, was uh, lucky enough to be given a contract by the National Museum of Scotland uh, back in the 70s, not long after I'd graduated up some entry in one of Petrie's mentioning a Neolithic in Western. Knew that Gordon Child came here to look for it. He hadn't found it because the way the dunes were configured, the site was well under sand. We were very lucky uh, that summer because in places there was erosion and we found one place in fact where the farmer had um, paved a track with scale knives, a particular type of stone tool. And that was a fairly um, big clue that there was uh, a site, a late Neolithic site somewhere in the vicinity. And so it's really nice to see the site gradually being laid open in front of our eyes and to go and visit it. And something that I would heartily recommend uh, if you haven't uh, already been there is to try and visit uh, the site up in Westray. It's a fantastic place to see these houses emerging. And of course, um, what I thought uh, might be uh, a, an interesting thing to do is just to uh, quickly run through right back to the very earliest time. You heard Martin talking there about these early dates. Um, from um, a core in South Ronaldsey, and that's very interesting. I mean, we're wanting to get handles on to what Orkney was like, uh, going right back into the early periods of deglaciation. And of course, one of the biggest things is that as Northwest Europe is emerging from the ice, the configuration of the land is different. And so you can see here, this was done a few years ago now for the National Geographic magazine, but an image showing how the UK and indeed Orkney lie as part of a big peninsula off the northwest um, coasts of, on, of, the, of, of Northwest Europe. I would say that this model's quite old fashioned now and there's much more detailed work being done. So perhaps some of the ways particularly of this, of the very early coastline now have changed, perhaps drawn in a little bit, but it's still a very changed landscape. We have to get our heads around the fact. And of course, as we're coming out of um, the ice, vegetation, all of these things very different. At what point, when do icebergs go from the coast, for example? Um, what One thing we do know is that by the time the very first people arrive in Orkney, um, Orkney is actually um, already an island. And I'm just, yeah, it's a bit odd. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully it'll hold itself there. Um, I think there's a little lag in, in what my computer's doing and what the what is coming through on the Zoom. But so we know that um, 
when the very first, uh, we call them Paleolithic, they're essentially uh, groups who are exploring into the new landscape right at, uh, in the, at the end of the last ice age in the period of deglaciation. And we know that people come to Orkney about 12, 13,000 years ago. Uh, we haven't got very much evidence. Uh, we've just got a few of their stone tools and things. Uh, we know that Orkney already was an island, so they must have uh, come over by boat. And, and indeed we find elsewhere around the coast of Europe evidence for, for water travel. Probably at that period of time, Orkney is two larger islands. Um, you can see them on the map here. So we have to think if people are coming across from Caithness, perhaps being drawn up into scapa flow, we really need a lot more information about this. So this is a period that's right for study. But as you can see from the picture, it's likely that a lot of the evidence is underwater and that brings with it uh, a whole suite of uh, issues uh, to examine it, to investigate it. And that's really totally different lecture set. Um, moving forward into the Mesolithic, well, of course, the one big problem that we have in the Mesolithic is that the sites are not spectacular in the way that one might think, you know, if you normally say Orkney archaeology immediately brings to mind pictures of Scarabray, whatever. Um, I think you can agree that pictures of uh, sites like this, which is Lynx House in Stronzi, maybe not quite as enticing to visit, maybe not a great holiday destination, but fascinating nonetheless. And from the work that's slowly emerging, we can build up a picture of a very different landscape, much more vegetation, much more woodland and things, and of the people who are living here and moving around that landscape. So again, still a lot of work to be done. And then uh, moving forward into the Neolithic, well, you might think that um, we know all there is to know. Of course, I uh, don't have to tell you that we don't. Just a few things that I find particularly interesting. Um, we see throughout the Neolithic incredible changes in society, some of which are reflected in the material culture, for example, in the houses or in some of the everyday goods that people are using. But I think we can be fairly certain that the majority are not reflected in that because, of course, as archaeologists, we pay much more attention to material culture than a lot of other societies do around the world. As archaeologists, we rely on material culture, whether it's a stone tool, a potsherd, or a, a remains of a house. We rely on material culture to know that people were there. But if you're actually living uh, in the world, you don't always think, oh, you know, I'm sitting here hunting this um, Dear, I must make sure I drop a few flints and scatter some charcoal so that archaeologists in the future know I was there. Um, so, you know, material culture, interesting, but we need to think of ways to kind of, of overcome it. But other things interesting about the Neolithic, what is, there's an increasing sort of um, question mark, I think, amongst British archaeologists about how does Orkney relate uh, to the rest, what's going on in the rest of the UK. Is Orkney just perhaps a slightly better preserved but fairly average manifestation of the Neolithic? Or was something very different going on up here? And how do you demonstrate difference? How do you prove difference? Lots of interesting things to think about. Burial, have we got all the tombs? Was everybody put into uh, chamber tombs? It would seem not. So where are the rest of them? What's going on? So you've got sort of big questions like that. And then you've got small questions like details of diet, uh, the role of wild foods, um, relative changing um, importance of cattle, all sorts of other things that you can really pick down into the minutiae. And so we move forward into the Bronze Age. For a long time, it was kind of regarded as a bit of a wilderness uh, in Orkney archaeology, which is quite surprising when you think of the fantastic sites like the site at Nows of Trotty. Um, I think, you know, partly the Bronze Age has suffered because it's got really sort of um, 
well, material culture rich site, uh, periods, either side with the Neolithic and the Iron Age, there's an awful lot going on in the Bronze Age and we've got an awful lot of work to do with. There's lots of burials all across Orkney. Where are people living? Have we got the houses? Are we recognising them? What's going on? Big questions, really, things to focus on. Moving into the Iron Age, I'm hesitant to say anything about that with Martin's face on my screen. Just keep smiling, Martin. Fix that smile. Um, but, you know, fantastic uh, sites and monuments, fantastic material culture in terms of everyday goods and things. We need to match them together. Big, big questions looking at changing natures of society, relationships with the wider world and things, much smaller questions, individual details of burial, individual details of diet, um, clothing, all these sorts of things. Plenty of work to keep everybody busy, um, but equally fantastic sites to visit. So don't be put off by the questions from going to visit places like uh, the Broch sites, Broch Gurness. And if you get an opportunity to visit, say the Cairns or one of the other sites during an excavation, grab it, just drop everything and go there because you can go to sites and monuments in all over the world very easily. Getting out to a site that's being excavated can be more difficult. And that's one of the exciting things that Orkney has to offer. Moving forward into the Pictish period, of course, one of the interesting things about the Picts is that we move into a time where we're trying to match the archeology span to written records, albeit very biased written records, Pictish uh, writing only telling us certain things. People are writing for very specific reasons. Uh, can everybody read and write? We do have some small, um, artifacts where certainly this, um, the little uh, spindle hall uh, that you can see on the screen, if the owner of that couldn't read it, they'd certainly been told what the, what the signs meant. So writing has an importance in society. And maybe there's writing beforehand that we're just not recognizing or that's been um, made on uh, materials that haven't survived. But lots of fascinating things in the pits, beginning to see perhaps some specializations that we've also had hints of earlier on, but in terms of metalworking, things like that, we've got settlement sites, burials, big question mark. So plenty of uh, work to be done. I think it's very difficult. Then we have to start asking ourselves, do we focus on the periods where we know more because we can contextualize our research or do we focus on the periods where we know less? All these things uh, to think about. And coming from the, the Picts into another well-known kind of fairly iconic Orkney period, the, the Viking period, um, lots of research projects over the last 20 or more years, um, mainly perhaps uh, quite a lot of work on what we might call high status settlements, perhaps because they're more obvious, um, but also other sites, perhaps slightly less high status, like the site at Quagro in Westry. Um, but some interesting um, work also that, that I've been following and finding really fascinating, where people are tying up, in fact, quite often using very sophisticated geoscience techniques, but tying them into things like oral history and place names. So you've got uh, the work by Sarah Jane on the, the St. Magnus, the landscape of St. Magnus. And you've got the recent publication by Alex Sandmark looking at uh, the sort of movement of Viking watercraft around uh, up to the north of the Loch of Harry and the Loch of Stennis. Um, so really nice, uh, examples of the way in which archaeology isn't just about excavation or finding material culture, but it can be much wider than that as well. And of course, one of the things that we tend to forget is that here in Orkney, we can actually walk around inside some of our Viking sites. St Magnus, uh, best 
known example, but I don't think we tend to think of it. How often do you go inside the cathedral and not think, you know, the foundation stones, the conception of this was Earl Ronald's. You know, he would have recognized it. He would have no doubt been a little bit grumpy, perhaps about some of the changes that we made, some of the places where we didn't, where we've deviated from his original ideas. But, you know, essentially it's still there doing what he intended it to do. But there are other places like the Kirk in Orpha, um, the little round Kirk where you can go and still stand inside an upstanding three-dimensional Viking building. I think as we come forward in time, the archaeology is often, again, it's tended to be a little bit neglected, if anything. There have been um, excavations, there are sites, but um, we have tended not to really focus our attention on it. And for that reason, projects like the work um, that the uh, Archaeology Institute are undertaking in Rousey, where they're looking at a farming landscape, are really important, looking at the way that's changing through time. Work done on the development of Kirkwall um, and small excavations of small kirks and things, all this goes to build up a picture of Orkney in the medieval and the historic period. And they are, there's a lot going on. They are really fascinating. So it's important not to kind of see a ruined farmstead and think, well, that's fairly recent. You know, we don't need to worry about it. The fact that it's falling down or somebody's going to um, build the, an extension across it. These places are still really significant for the story of the islands and for what they can contribute to our understanding of Orkney and the people who've lived in Orkney. And it's, you know, not just about ordinary people, but we have got some fantastic high status buildings from that period. The Earl's Palace in Kirkwall, I just love it. Look at those oriel windows. They must have been gobsmacking to the people of Orkney. I'll bet the rumour mills went mad across Orkney. They must have thought he was out of his mind using that amount of glass in the climate like this. And how did they get the glass up here? Did it all come by ship, packed in straw? I'm showing my own ignorance here. I don't know. Was it made in Orkney? Did it provide a lot of employment? But, you know, if you look at the sort of um, many other Orkney buildings up to this point in time, people are not going for big windows. And, you know, even it's only really in recent times with changes in technology that we're all putting in glazed extensions and things. So there's a lot of things about the Earl's Palace where Earl Patrick's really pushing boundaries. Of course, sadly, he went bankrupt and never really... <clears throat> enjoyed you know you could argue perhaps that it was a uh, wasted effort or you know he, it was shown that he was wrong but but I think you know just having the courage to do that is pretty amazing and how you know how does that relate to the world outside what's going on outside and things and then of course I think we're all very aware of uh, wartime Orkney um, and increasing interest being given. The um, leaflets uh, that Gavin and his colleagues have been making in Hoy, Martin was um, showing us again, funding going towards that, really, really important. We've got a fantastic suite of wartime um, sites and monuments here in Orkney from both world wars. I always think it's amazing that the juxtaposition of the paintings inside the Italian chapel with the paintings at Ness Battery, that we don't make more of that. You know, look at the sort of religious iconography of the Italians and the very domestic, very sort of bucolic iconography of the British troops in Stromness some really interesting uh, things, sort of statements being made there. And of course, um, we can move there into, again, the submerged landscape and the fantastic relics, the Royal Oak, uh, the remains of the German fleet and things. So wartime Orkney is a very sort of eclectic and complete record. And one that 
um, we should perhaps uh, make a bit more more of or it's nice to see people beginning to make more of it uh, now once again it's not letting yeah brilliant and having said that I mean one of the things about wartime Orkney is um, the management of these buildings. I mean, it is amazing in some ways that Scarab Ray has survived. And then we're looking at the, the timber buildings at Nest Battery or the concrete buildings at, say, Hoxha, um, perhaps a little bit more problematic from the point of view of management and things. But the management, I mean, in a, those of us, the Orkney Archaeology Society, those of us that work in archaeology or that um, live here in Orkney, we've all got a responsibility to think about these issues. What do we want to preserve? What do we just let go? We haven't got enough money to do everything. What do we excavate? What do we leave? Should we open everything to the public? But then you get sites where you actually get too many visitors. Um, we've all been very aware of the fencing and the path management at the Ring of Brogga. Um, and, you know, maybe we should be thinking about spreading the footfall, but how do we do that? Can we get people out to other sites on the islands? But of course, one of the problems with having a World Heritage Site is that you might have equally interesting sites in other parts of Orkney, but everybody wants to go to the one that's got the badge. They want to get the T-shirt that says World Heritage Site. So there's lots of very kind of um, difficult things to be thinking about. Should we be looking at the big sites? Should we be looking at small sites? I just put up a little pillbox that's at the bottom of my track. Um, it's a really interesting one, but it's not listed or protected in any way. Um, it's just looked after because the person who owns the land is interested in it. But these are things that we need to think about. Um, if we want the archaeology of Orkney to go forward into the future, because archaeology is not just about the past. Archaeology is very much about the future. And of course, these are questions that, particularly after a difficult year, like the year that we've just had, where for a profession where a lot of the work is done outside, um, we've had to adapt to different ways of doing things. Perhaps no bad thing, it's made us look at um, examining other sources of data that perhaps get a little bit ignored and things. But we have to think about how are we going to move forward into the future. I think, um, I, well, I've just put a few things up. I mean, I'm kind of assuming that maybe next year is going to be a bit weird, but we are going to get back uh, into the sort of lifestyle in some way recognizable from what we've been doing in the past. I think, you know, excavation will remain important, field survey and things. Um, I know some universities at Aberdeen, for example, we've got the students out excavating at the moment. So you can also, you can excavate under socially distanced conditions. Um, you just have to do it a bit differently. Geoscience, really interesting. Lots of um, interesting work. If you kind of tap down into the forensic techniques that are now part of archaeology massive contributions to be made. And of course, none of them uh, are done or none of them contribute by themselves. You really have to start combining things. But it's not just about combining the scientific with the scientific. We also need to be looking at ways of combining the scientific with the kind of fluffy, with oral or early excavation data, that sort of thing. Building a community, archaeology only exists because people care about it. So it's really, really important that the work of societies like this is supported and goes on um, because we need people to think that the sites of the past matter. Otherwise, we won't look after them. Otherwise, we won't try and find out what they mean. And of course, in this day and age, we've got lots of digital communication techniques that we can be making use of. And it's really nice to see that sort of thing happening. But also I think publication, you know, 
when push comes to shove, there's nothing like a good big book that you can curl up in front of the fire with. And we've just had the geophysics work uh, from the World Heritage Sites. There's the Nessa Brogger volume about to come out. These are fantastic examples of the sort of thing that we need to keep on doing. So um, that's really taken me to the end of my um, chat. I hope it's been vaguely interesting. I'm obviously happy to take questions. You've got my email if you think of something in the middle of the night or whatever. And um, you might get a bit more information about sort of me and what I do. I realize that I'm just a dark waving um, figure in silhouette, which I apologize for, but the way the lighting is set up in here, I'm afraid um, that's how I come out. And anyway, what is important is the images on the screen. But um, hopefully we can get a bit of discussion going now. So I would think uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and open the floor for Haley and other people to um, bring in general discussion and things. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was really interesting. Martin, do you want to chair this bit or do you want me to just run oh, through that? I, no, I, I, no preference one way or the other. Happy to do either, uh, whichever you'd like. Well, as, as it's your last AGM, maybe you should you should do it. Okay, <laughs> I'll keep an eye on the chat if any questions come through. There's just been really a comment so far from Claire, um, Claire Marsh saying that she loves and shares the curiosity of looking into people's lives and time traveling, a perfect combination. Yes, nosiness and displacement from one's time period. What a perfect combination. What, what more could you hope for, as Caroline has suggested? Um, yes, what a privilege to, for me to, to do my last uh, Q&A as uh, chair of the, the society. So that's very nice of you. Thank you very much, Hayley. Um, any questions then from the floor? Um, at the risk of a clamour of voices <laughs> and maybe indicate your interest to, to, to ask a question by... The use of a hand so that we don't get that clamour but uh, would anyone like to go first and ask Caroline a question about any of the interesting things that she's reflected on this evening? There's a, there's a question in the chat from Keith, how do we ensure that excavations are written up and disseminated? <laughs> well of course you know the story, I think it's probably apocryphal that historic environment Scotland many names ago, uh, decided that they were only going to fund uh, excavation by people who hadn't got a backlog of unpublished work and then discovered that that took out all of the archaeologists in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a difficult problem. It's a problem that Orkney... Okay, so I don't know whether I am more familiar with Orkney than other places. I would say it's a problem that Orkney suffers from in particular with some big uh, excavations, big name sites that have not been published. Uh, one of the biggest problems, not always the case, but in many cases, the archeologists who run the excavations, uh, when they finish their period of field work, they then go back to a day job. And that's one reason that I always managed to publish the sites that I was working on because I never had a day job. So my day job was writing up the site. But you know, if you go back to working in a museum or teaching in a university, it's a very, very different thing. But um, of course, what you should be doing if you have got a day job is delegating for too long, um, Historic Environment Scotland perhaps were not able to fund um, maybe you appointing a project manager to oversee your publication. Whether that's changed, no idea. But um, yeah, I think we just have to put on the moral pressure that, it, I mean, the other thing for me is that if I went out and dug a site, if it wasn't published, I might as well have not existed. And that site's just been destroyed. Um, so unless you publish your material, there is absolutely no point in digging it. 
but of course um, there's a lot of good intentions and an awful lot of archaeological material under people's beds and things. Time coming, make a point. Um, I think it's very true, Caroline. Yes, I hate to think about the backlog, not just in Orkney, but many other sites that have never been published prior to the, the usually the death of the, the excavator. But one of the problems has always been in Orkney is that we have too good archaeology in the, the preservation, the amount of finds, the, the stratigraphy is so well preserved that quite often it takes an awful lot more to write up a site in Orkney than it does for some of the smaller sites down south where you're dealing with um, you know, just a set of post holes or something much more ephemeral. So, but yes, hands up. Yes, I still am writing up mine how, but fingers crossed that should be uh, out next year. But uh, yes, it is a perennial problem. And uh, I think the HES started, or Old Historic Scotland started to uh, address that problem when they uh, insisted on people bringing out uh, data structure reports each year. Not exactly some of the most exciting reading you'll ever make, but at least it's there. The basis of each excavation is out there. And I think that in this day and age as well, where it's the dissemination to not only our academic peers is important, but also the dissemination to the wider public. But I think your know, many excavations, you're know, excelling that. I'm not kind of saying you're know, using the NES as a you know, an ideal situation. It's not, no excavation is. But I think that we've got to think in the kind of wider context of who we're digging for. It's no longer just the academics because without the support of the public, et cetera, then it just won't happen at all. And I think that's proven as much as anywhere in, in Orkney, where um, we exist not just as uh, academics, but as there to you know, involve the, the much, much wider community. So it's always a double-edged sword. But uh, yes, hands up. I don't think there's any archaeologist amongst us who would kind of say, yes, I'm totally up to date. Within two years of finishing an excavation, it's fully written up and published. But it is being addressed, and I think it is getting better. I know in Orkney, for instance, in the, the next year or so, there's, well, as you said, the World Heritage Geophysics, that's coming out. Uh, the NES major interim report, I emphasise just interim. I think uh, one of the scary things about the NES was that the interim is a, what, 400 page volume. So I don't know how many volumes the final report will be, but I know Jane's Barrow project is uh, nearing completion. And uh, as I said, mine house should see the light of day next year. So it is getting together, but it is that ever going problem. You never have enough time and also it's keeping up the momentum so much in Orkney, I think, with uh, the Institute, which, you know, 30 years ago, there was, what, three, three practicing archaeologists in Orkney, and now we have, what, 30, 40? Well, a lot of that has just been through the, the damn hard work, which has kind of diversified sometimes uh, the, the way that archaeology is practiced up here. Then we have witted enough, so next question. Or next I, was, I was just going to say, I think another problem in the past was that unbelievably sites were excavation was financed without any consideration of money for yeah. post excavation. So when mm -hmm. I dug on rum in the 1980s, I asked for a guarantee of post excavation money and they wouldn't give it to me. I mean, they were quite happy for me to go mm -hmm. and dig stuff up. But, you know, I mean, in fact, we did get it in the end. But, um, you know, in those days, people just, well, of course, there was a lot. And this goes on to the point that Collins made in the chat about, um, you know, the integration of science and, excav and no doubt, you know, there's no doubt that the analysis of all the data is much more expensive now. And I yeah. think you know, in the up into the 80s, there was just a kind of thought that, well, you, you know, you just had to sit down and lay everything out in rows and the site report sort of miraculously appeared in front of you. Um, and, the, you know, I think archaeologists have been on a steep learning curve about project management and integration. Of course, now it's become a, it's a bit of a vicious circle because the longer you leave your publication the more you can do with the material as I think um, mm -hmm. you know projects like Scarabray have found 
that ironically had that been published in the 70s it would have been a much smaller volume now every time they think they're getting ready to submit it to a publisher somebody finds something else that they can do with the data and the whole thing's delayed for another two or three years yeah lots of complex issues that feed into this and, and lots of historical issues as well and the advent of project management is the, in a tighter more formal basis as you were saying Caroline and the, the advent of MAP2 management of archaeological projects that came in in 1989 and then again in 1990 so we've tightened up but we still have this backlog. Um, Keith do you I think you wanted to come back in there. Yes please um, the reason I asked the question is because this morning I was with the an archaeology group from uh, um, Poland working uh, at a major site in Cyprus. And I was speaking to the site director and uh, she was complaining bitterly that the whole of the site had been excavated with no uh, written uh, um, uh, records of what was done. So they're re-excavating excavated work and they have no idea what's gone before them. And this is, you know, another World Heritage Site. That's a horrendous situation. I mean, I um, wrote up a few years ago an excavation that was 40 years old, and not a World Heritage Site, and not a site with the depth of data that, you know, most of the people here are used to dealing with. And it was extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, just making sense of sections and plans and things um, which obviously at the time they were made all seemed to be well documented and labelled but laying them out over your floor and trying to reconstruct it sadly the excavator had died um, you know it's very very difficult and particularly I think when we are dealing with older yeah older projects and unfortunately that's the problem in a way with world heritage sites that because they're interesting, they would attract excavation attention, particularly maybe in the past when we didn't worry so much about these things. Martin, I think there's a question from Moira in the chat, um, which is about, about um, Caroline talking about saving sites for the future, particularly the more recent sites. Is there any strategy as to how this or could or should be done? And is there any criteria for sites that should be protected? other than scheduling them. I feel we really need Julie here to talk about the sort of, because there are local criteria that, you know, Orkney has a very active islands archeologist and obviously working through Orkney Islands Council, there are criteria that are applied. Um, with regard to strategy, well, as you mentioned it, Orkney is, um, working on a um, what's called a well a, a, a local or regional I'm not sure which but there is a, a Scottish um, archaeological research framework which has there's been a national one done uh, it's now being done for different areas Orkney is um, about to if it hasn't already actively started the process of that so the answer to your question is Yes, there are strategies and yes, there are criteria. Of course, one problem is that as we know more about archaeology, the strategies and the criteria keep changing. I think not only that, but also the politics change. Yeah, very true. Yeah. When you think about the, 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 the changes in planning law that have been proposed, um, it's quite horrendous. Yeah, right to... Well, write to your MP, Delhi <laughs> Alistair with letters. Um, yeah, I mean, politics changing, economic circumstances change. I mean, obviously, there are times when development takes place with less um, concern for the past. There are other times where the past has a value and so there might be a lot of concern for the past. Um, and I don't know, it's very difficult. It's very easy to criticize people who are drawing up these strategies or criteria for not engaging with the community. In actual fact, and well, I, maybe I, it's just me, but other people who, I think 
doing, you know, trying to engage with a community and get a community debate going on something like what should we preserve of the past or should we preserve wartime remains? It's very difficult. I don't know if anyone um, who's tried it has got a view on that. I think it's a it's a funny one. Um, I don't want to <coughs> indulge myself here, but I think I think when you wrap it up in archaeology with that very notion that it is archaeology, there's something slightly distancing for some members of the public from that. And actually, the way they respond to the <coughs> the fabric of the past all around them is not via the medium of archaeology in inverted commas, but through their own local traditions and their own dialogues and their own discourses and narratives growing up as PD folk in Orkney and their ancestors and their family and all the rest of it. And and sometimes it's rather off-putting for some some sections of the public to actually wrap it up in this codified set of practices that we call archaeology. So whilst we know that we're after the best for those monuments, sometimes the very act of being involved in it is also slightly forbidden to uh, sections of the public. So yeah. it's so important for for organisations like the OAS to try to reach out and, and mobilise and generate the interest from the multi-generational Orcadian uh, families and, and individuals as well. I think getting the kids in is a key there as well to secure that long-term goodwill towards um, the, all the things that we care about indeed. Um, and it's just, uh, it is about perception, isn't it? I mean, the number of people who will go in and out of St Magnus but never really think of it as a relic of the Vikings. Um, you know, so we might not think of St Magnus as part of our archaeological estate or our heritage estate. Um, and the more professional that archaeology is, in a way, the more that wall is built up, which, of course, we don't want. Well, I'd, I'd say that in Orkney, we've, we've kind of not waged a war against that, but I think OES and uh, the old Archaeology Trust and having the Institute here has changed people's perceptions. And I think that you know, it's seen much more as part of the community and a valuable part of it. And I think when it comes to showing that archaeology contributes so much to the Orkney economy each year, sometimes it does take that pound shillings and pence sign to appear in people's perception to, for them to value it. And uh, I'd just take one example of uh, this old man who visited the nest during one of our open days, very traditional, dare I say, Arcadian farmer. But uh, he said, boy, he said, I didn't understand it before, but now I do. And uh, you know, that, just that one comment, I thought, you know, was a, a huge compliment, not just to the nest, but to the way that archaeology is, is, is uh, taken on board in, in Orkney and the, the involvement of everybody, whether it's the schools, just everybody. Mm. Can I, can I uh, yeah. um, I, have you got me, Martin, can I speak? Yeah, please do, David. Yeah, thank you. It's just to follow on from what Nick was saying there. If you put the cliches aside that we get uh, on television screens and media reportage, uh, about uh, Orkney being living history and so on. It may well be the case that a community like Orkney is living with archaeology much more than most other communities in Britain. And I can't think of an integrated community. We are an island community, but I can't think of an integrated community that is more in touch with its historical past than Orkney is. Mm. And, uh, you know, whether it's people 200 years ago objecting to the Odin stone getting knocked down and dragged away, or people being concerned what happens to our monuments and sites today with the developments with um, uh, electricity substations and so on. There is a, there is a real living sense of archeology, span uh, of our historical archeological past as being part of the fabric of community today. And I think Nick has encapsulated that very well. Um, the interest in the Ness isn't just the fascinating aspects of uh, late Neolithic um, archaeology. It's got to do with it being a component part of a recognised and familiar Orkney landscape. And while many people, I see we have friends from North America who are regretting not getting to Orkney this year, uh, 
we have huge numbers of people that are uh, tied into Orkney archaeology, but we have a community that's quite committed to it as well. Not just as Nick says correctly, because it generates income for the community as a whole, but because they buy into, they mm -hmm. associate, uh, they associate with that historical past and that prehistorical past. And I think that's quite an important role for us as an archaeological society to carry forward, drive forward the work that the academics that have spoken here tonight are carrying out, but also to link that to the community it's taking place in, in revealing its past, in looking to its future, but also engaging with it in the present day just now. Martin, I think Colleen is, is indicating to come in. Oh yeah, please do, Colleen. Okay, thank you. Um, that just it's following on really from what uh, what David has just said, and that is that the one thing that has always marked out um, to me anyway the uh, the community in Orkney um, is that it's very very much embedded in its in its past as well as in the future. It sits really astride the two, and and I think it's really really important because when you know when we write these academic books, these endless tomes which you know you only only the, the person who'd written them would actually really wish to wade through when we've written these and produced these our main market is always Orkney there's a tremendous um, knowledge within Orkney and a wish to know about its past it doesn't matter whether it's whether it's Vikings or Mesolithic it doesn't really matter what the period is um, and I think that that's one of the things that marks out uh, a particularly discerning um, audience in Orkney, and and you know, as archaeologists, I mean, we we really should serve that as we do. We try to do that. It's very hard, but um, but in in many cases, it's a, it's certainly uh, certainly worthwhile. And this is a highly literate uh, society, uh, which continues all the way through from the time of the, of the sagas um, and and I think that this is a this is a really strong continuum and, and we're part of it now um, and archaeology is very much embedded in today much more embedded than it was when I was started to work in the 70s as Caroline did 70s and 80s um, but even then people were always interested in what we did um, but now we have so much more to offer and so much more to uh, communicate and and I think it's just tremendously exciting um, and to have a society such as this is 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 just fantastic as far as I'm concerned um, and uh, I, I, I can't say any more than that because it's really really very exciting and the community is is very much grounded in its past um, and it's great to see that thank you Mark if I could just just make a quick comment, I think um, it, it builds on both what, what David and Colleen, but others have said as well. I think one of the things that as a society that we do, and I, like I, said, I didn't hear all of your contributions, I don't know if it was mentioned, but obviously it's the amount of the money that we raise that we can then give back out in grants. And I did hear you refer to some of the grants that we give, but the favourite grants that we've given, as far as I'm concerned, over the last few years, have been the support that we've given financially to setting up the Young Archaeologists Club in Orkney. And also, I remember, I think it was two or maybe even three years ago, but we gave a small grant to one of the schools in the Hope to come and visit the Cairns excavation. Um, and that was to pay towards the cost of the transport and so on and so forth. So to me, it's brilliant when we can give the grants to any of the archaeology you know, exploits that we do. And it's also kind of then links in why as a society we're, we're constantly pushing things like, please go to our shop or please do this or please do that. Because in reality, what we've aimed to do over the last few years is effectively give out every year in grants the equivalent of the money that we raise as a society for the society through the shop. So the more that people spend in the shop, the more money that we have to give out grants. So I'll just get a quick plug in there. We are online. We've got some great goods in there at the moment. But I think to me, it's that kind of link that we've made as a society to the Young Archaeologists Club, to the schools. So it's not just the, you know, the, the stuff that we give to the excavations that enables dating, which is brilliant and fantastic. But it's about bringing on the next generation and, and particularly the Orcadian school children who, you know, well, you know, whether they've come in from elsewhere or they've been born in Orkney, it's about getting their enthusiasm for their own sites. And that's that link back from our present into our future as well, which I think is really critical. And I'm really proud as a society that, we, that we've that we played a strong role in that. And, and I really, really hope that we can carry on doing that 
uh, for a long time into the future as well. Yeah, I think Orkney is one of the few places in the UK where being an archaeologist is just part of life. Um, you know, in some ways, I think we have to be very careful about having a bit of an us and them. There's the sort of the archaeologists and the community. And that, you know, isn't what we're striving for. And to me, you know, living and working as an archaeologist in Orkney, I am a part of the community and the community is a part of my archaeology. And um, but I don't think that's very common around the UK. There are other countries um, in the world. I mean, Raggy, I'm sure, is here. And I've, it's always been my experience in Norway that archaeology is much more embedded into the community in Scandinavia, in fact, not just in Norway, than it is in the UK. And certainly for me, that's one of the big attractions for Orkney, that there are lots of archaeologists here. So nobody bats an eyelid when you say you're an archaeologist. Whereas when I lived in Edinburgh, if you said you were an archaeologist, you'd instantly get a reaction you know even if it's just people saying oh that's interesting which is lovely but it's still kind of setting it aside whereas here people are just like oh yeah sure you know <laughs> one of the things that i think is also exceptionally interesting about orkney is the fact that that interest and, and keen interest in the past doesn't only stretch back into the current uh, orcadian community and, and the recent historical Orcadian community, but actually, when you explore many of those periods that you provided that very nice summary of tonight, Caroline, when you go back into the Iron Age period, you see that they're they're very interested in the Neolithic monuments. When you went to episodes of the Bronze Age, they're relocating themselves vis-a-vis -vis Neolithic monuments and landscapes. Uh, it's part and parcel of the richness and the substance and the bulk of the the material uh, re residues that you talked about already tonight, Caroline, um, but we have this exceptionally good evidence in Orkney for the past in the past. And, and that's always been there. I mean, people have always been interested in the past and we can actually see that in the ancient archeology span itself as well. And that's just a remarkable uh, lesson that we learned from Orkney. That's very, very um, high resolution here in Orkney, partly because of the preservation of things, but partly because maybe, as you said at the beginning of your talk, it is and has been a special place. And so, you know, it's that it's got that exceptional resource to give us an insight into that past and past in the past as well. It's remarkable. Yeah, reuse of monuments and things. Yeah. And, and are there other themes and areas? Uh, I'm aware that we've we've spent quite a bit of time there on the thinking about management, about priorities, and about the future of archaeology and about uh, the archaeology of the future, even to some extent as well. But um, are there other themes or issues um, that, that uh, Caroline raised that anyone would like to ask any more questions about and uh, things uh, on, on other matters that you would like to, to, to discuss? Uh, well, I hope I haven't curtailed that really interesting discussion. <laughs> then, in that case, although that we did spend quite a bit of time there, so in the interest of letting you off the hook to some extent, Caroline, um, uh, maybe maybe we should uh, round up at that stage. Then, in that case, um, the uh, all, all that remains to be done then, in that case, in terms of Caroline's contribution tonight, is just register our approval and our appreciation in the normal way, or well, as weird as that is across the network. But <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, um, well, I, that's been a really successful AGM. Uh, thanks to everyone's contributions. Thank you in particular to our speaker tonight and to everyone who um, launched themselves into that really interesting discussion in the aftermath of Caroline's uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I actually don't know what events we've got lined up, but you, I can assure you this, there'll be plenty, they'll be thick and they'll be fast, and there will be uh, other online events like this um, to allow us to maintain our uh, progress even in the midst of uh, social distancing in the midst of COVID. Uh, so unless anyone wants to sort of prod me and tell me, of course, there's this talk coming up or whatever, then please do just stay tuned to uh, OES Facebook and all the other social media and all the other 
usual outlets for information uh, because we'll have some really interesting things coming up before too long. He was putting her hand up. I knew I could rely on you to add to this picture. <laughs> yeah, but actually, no, not with an event at this stage. We do have a few events in the pipeline, but we don't have anything set in the diary yet. So we'll be talking about that as a new board. But I was just going to say two things. If um, people who are on the board, if they could just wait at the end of this call and we'll have a very quick post AGM board meeting where we'll be determining the new officers, which is what we need to do. And the, the final thing I guess to say would be just to say thank you very much to Martin on behalf of all of us on the board. Um, we can't do a presentation. We haven't got we haven't got you anything. Sorry, there's not going to be a big surprise. There's not going to be a knock on your door and somebody's going to come up with a great bunch of flowers. We've not been that organised. Um, but, it, you know, you have been on the board, I think, for 10 years. So um, that's a long time. It, people will be really delighted to hear that although we couldn't persuade Martin to stay on the board, even as a as a backseat member, he has agreed to stay a part of the grants committee. So, um, so we'll be continuing to get his insight on the grants committee from now on. So we don't quite let him go that easily. But I did want to say on behalf of the board and behalf of the society, thank you very much, Martin, in the traditional way. So thank you. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and pri privilege to be involved. And in, my only regret is not having more time to be more full time involved in things and to have, have acquitted myself better still. Um, but I know that um, that it's passing on to safe hands and that the, the continuity that's coming about through the the members that are reinst reinstalled this evening and the new members that are coming in are going to make a, continue to make a really formidable and really uh, positive society that's going to continue to have these amazing impacts. So thanks for those kind words, everyone. And, and I'll be no stranger. I'm going nowhere, really, and I'll be able to see you all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have no doubt I'll, I'll, I will, uh, whenever they let me, I'll, I'll tell you things about our findings from our aid sites and things like that as well. And so... I uh, will look forward to continuing to work with the OES and enjoying uh, hearing about how they get on in the near future. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, OK, we're at an end to our event then, so I guess we can all go. What a merry gathering it's been. No, it's been great for everyone to come out or to see everyone come out. And uh, thanks once again. And thanks again to Caroline uh, and to, to everyone who organised the event tonight. And uh, look out for notices of uh, future events to come in the near future. Cheers folks, I'll head off.